Today it's an it's an honor to be talking to one of my favorite townies of all time. I mean, my God, you've got you're coming up on what eight thousand posts on Dental Town. You've been on there. You're you're a legend on Dental Town, and I, I love your karma. I love your energy, and, and I can't believe how much you've done in such a short time. I mean, I'm fifty two. You're only thirty five. You could be my kid. You could be my son. I mean, you're you're crushing it, and uh, God, you're just high energy. You're smart. Your attention to detail. I mean. If, if there's any dentist who's just crushing it on every detail, it's you, dude. How's it feel to be like the American dream dentist? Well, I appreciate your comments on me, but, you know, it's I, I just enjoy doing this. I, I don't think too much about it. You know, they always say, you know, it's nothing's work if you enjoy doing it. And some of the people in dental town, they're like, oh, you work too much. You know, uh, you, you spend all your time doing this stuff. But I love it. Like, you know, right right now, it's, it's what I want to do. And that's what I focus my energy on. And. I'd uh, be just sitting around wasting my day drinking beer or something like that. So I might as well put it to good use. So I enjoy it. Yeah. It's very nice to me. And, and it comes through loud and clear that you're you're doing this. I mean, it's a it's not even work for you. It's your life. Yep. It's your passion. Yep. It's your hobby. And you're always just so high energy and good karma. And uh, and even perfect hair. I mean, you are you're ah. just you have perfect <laughs> hair and perfect teeth. You're making me feel extra bald today, buddy. Extra I never, old. So, I was going to so, say, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I never had braces when I was younger, so I think I was meant to be a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good one. So, so, so first of all, um, talk, about, talk about your discovery. How, how did you get onto the Dental Maverick? I mean, you, you have a very interesting feedback that everybody on Dental Town talks about and loves. And uh, I was talking to you before the show that your, your website, your 40 videos, I, I wish you'd put like your first one on Dental Town just so the ones stumbling through can see it and get turned on to you. Um, how did Dental Maverick come about? And tell, tell us about that. Well, you know, there's, we go back in time for a little bit. You know, I, I found Dental Town a long time ago, like in 2007. And I think one of the things you say about Dental Town is that you never practice alone. Okay. I believe that's what you say. And it, it's absolutely true. You know, when I first became a dentist, uh, I think we all learn traditionally, meaning that most dentists, they have an associateship, they work for someone, something like that. And they learn from the dentist that is their boss or their leader or something like that. But a lot of information that we learn from them, it's who did this boss guy learn from? Another guy that he worked for. So we learn very traditionally and that may be great, but you know, when you find a place like Dental Town or something like that, you see the possibilities of every type of dentist. Like when I became a dentist, I thought I would work for this dentist and he told me it took him 10 years to become successful. And I thought, that's what I'm gonna do because that's what he did. But then I found Dental Town and I found that, whoa, there are all these dentists that are successful. There are some that are less successful, but there's a mixture of everything. And from this, you can learn everything. So I decided at one point, you know, I'm gonna open my own practice and I wanna be successful. And I, how can I emulate these successful doctors? So I read everything on Dental Town. Like, I think I spent one year reading three hours, four hours every day. I mean, that's all I did. So I gathered all the information, good and bad. I learned from people's successes, non-success stories, how they responded to things. And I inputted all, all that in my head so I could put it into my personal business. And as I grew my business, you know, I, I've always wanted to be some sort of teacher. So Dental Town and the ability to type and communicate with other dentists is great because it gives me an outlet to just, you know, I enjoy this, like I said, you know, it gives me the opportunity just to talk to people and then, um, you know, eventually, you know, I, I, I think at least I do fairly well enough, at least in my eyes. Um, and then people started messaging me uh, over time. They're saying, hey, you know what? You have some good information. Why don't you ever teach some of this stuff? And I never took it too seriously. And then one day you know, I do a lot of things. One of the other things I do is I run a business group in town. So my the, guy, the people in my group are like, I know you don't work Fridays. And I know all you do on Fridays is sit around, watch TV and drink some beer. Why don't you do something with your time? And I was like, you're absolutely right. I'm going to do this. So it took me a year to write this, and I wrote like over 160 pages of, of text, and I edited it, and I started creating this, and here we are. And so I enjoy doing this, and like I said, that, that's, that's my story so far. So Dental Maverick is a book and a website with videos then? Well, I had to write the text first for myself personally. So it's like a script. Like I wrote it for myself, and it gives me the ability to edit it and reposition it because when I first wrote it, it was just like stream of consciousness. Like I wrote it, but I didn't like the format. I didn't like the layout. I didn't like how I ordered everything. So uh, I had to re-edit it. And eventually, I you know I, I should copyright and eventually make it like a book and just release it as a book. But for the moment, um, I was thinking like I wanted to do something visual you know, with audio and with like a, you know, like a video, there's stuff on the background because everyone learns differently. Okay. Like there are some people that are just purely 
audio and they just want to listen to in the car. But there are other people that like seeing someone visually, you know, the expression of it, you know, like when I do these videos, I'm pretty into it. Okay. Like I'm pretty motivated by it. But um, so I hope that translates too, because if I'm really into this and someone's watching it and they see the energy and they see how I really believe in this, then they're more prone to believe in it. So that's why we did videos. Um, you know, you can, some people read with a book and eventually we just have text or something like that. Or maybe I could just, you know, you know, give a copy to all the people that, that, that sign up for this as a text. But I think this way I cover all the bases because people can watch me and they can listen or they can do whatever. They can turn off the screen if they want and just listen or some people can just look at me. And, but, I, and I, I personally think the videos are also better for like when you're at home, your, mm -hmm. signif your significant other watching it together like a social event. Sure. And, and your videos are perfect for staff meetings where you just sit there and say, Okay, we're not going to see Pace for an hour, and let's yeah. look at look at this guy's energy and feed off that. And yeah. I think the uh, I you know what I think you should do with your uh, your text, your 160 pages of text. You're talking about writing a book. Um, the reason I start getting into these podcasts and I've now done like 50 of them is the fact that um, um th this new smartphone, which when I was your age, you were like you're 35. When I yes. was 35, there was there was no cell phones. I mean, nobody had a cell phone unless you had some government guy with this huge brick phone in a in a briefcase with a big True. battery and plugged it into your car lighter. Um, and and now what I'm seeing with uh, what all the young dentists and all the dental schools are telling me is they they like to do podcasts because they like to multitask. Uh, sure. They, they like to. Uh, I, I I have had most. Most common feedback I've been getting on these is that uh, I do it while I'm an hour on the treadmill. I, That's what I, I do. Yeah, I do it. Um, um, uh, this lady dentist up the street from me says uh, Saturday mornings takes me about four hours to do all the week's uh, cleaning and laundry and, and all that stuff. And she goes, I listen to four of them back to back every Saturday morning uh, doing all that stuff. So, so on your text, the mm -hmm. next thing we're going to do is uh, audiobooks because we've, um, um, you know, I, I've had literally hundreds of books given to me over the years from Dennis and sure. you should do the first one where you just read that It'd probably take like six hours and do sure. the first audio book on our new dental town app. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm scheduled to go into a sound booth and read my book uh, for six hours. And uh, that, oh. that, that would be uh, that'd be awesome. Just that way. Uh, you know? Um, so, so, um, so what do you, what do you want to start with? Uh, um, bridge, talk about the, uh, why you created dental Maverick course on uh, bridging gap with uh traditional consulting and weekend courses? Sure. You know, I, I think there's a place for every type of, of, of educational, you know, educational um, um, format. Okay. Like, uh, I, I feel like I'm bridging the gap between traditional consulting and weekend courses. Um, but certainly there's a, there's a benefit to everything. Like, for example, uh, weekend courses are great, but the downside is you have to take off time to travel. You lose production. And basically all the data that you want to learn, all the information is compressed really greatly into like this short time frame. So I don't know about you, but a lot of times if I learn something new, it takes time for my brain to absorb and that marinate in my mind. Like I've gone to some great courses and I go home and I think about it. And even though I have the manual and the textbook or whatever I've learned, I only remember certain key points. So I don't feel like for weekend courses, you get the advantage of having the ability to let some of these uh, major topics, even though they might be very simple to absorb in you so your mind processes it. Um, on the other hand, traditional consulting is great, you know, there's a, it, it's awesome because if you want to, I feel like if you want to abate uh, your responsibility, you can have someone that holds your hand. They can take over all the responsibilities for you. They can manage your staff. They can teach your office systems. They can enforce the <laughs> systems. But the downside to traditional consulting is that one, at least I feel like your leadership skills may not grow like you want to because you're offloading the duties to someone else. And secondly, um, you know, what happens when do you end uh, your contract with them? You know, if you don't have the leadership skills, then uh, you may have all these systems and checklists. But if you don't have the leadership to enforce these or keep your staff accountable for it, then, you know, you start tapering off and you lose some of this. The value I, of the I, I want to stop you right there because that, sure. that, that, that's a big concept. So do you think leaders are born? Do you think that you're just either born a singer, a dancer, an athlete, a leader or you're not? And yes or no on that. Do you, okay. think, do you think you're born a leader? And if, and if you think maybe I wasn't born a singer, song or dance writer, athlete, whatever, how, first of all, how do you define leadership and how do you develop leadership skills? And, sure. and because, because you did it at an incredibly young age. 
Sure, I think that's a great question. Like there are certain, for, I, I personally believe that there are certain things like physical things that you just can or can't do. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm five foot five, okay? I can't play basketball. I'll never play basketball well enough to be on the NBA, you know? I don't have a beautiful voice. You know, I can sing, but who wants to really listen to me sing terrible karaoke? So during <laughs> physical activities, I believe that anyone can learn sets of skills for anything. Like. Most people in downtown, if they see me and they see my posts, they think I'm this type of person. And I am now. But if you knew me years ago, especially before I started and I signed my note for whatever money to, to build my own office, I was a different person. I was very quiet. I was very introverted. I didn't voice my opinions very much. But then one day, you know, I signed this big fat loan to build my office. And I'm like, I have three options. I can sink. I can swim. I barely tread water, or I could be like Michael Phelps, because this was during the time when, you know, Michael Phelps was during the U.S. Olympics. So you, so start, I decided, so you start smoking pot. You went with Michael oh, Phelps well, and start smoking pot. And that was back in the day. That's what I, <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, in any case, um, I decided that I'm going to be successful. And I thought about it. I'm like, how can one be successful? And so, like I said, I was reading Dental Town. Uh, I thought about all the doctors I've worked with, and I've worked with some very successful doctors, and I realized... There's a common theme. Some of these doctors that are very successful, they enjoy going to the work. They enjoy talking to people. They are, in general, more extroverted. They are more, they take up a leadership skill and they're not afraid of it. So I thought about all these things and I was like, okay, how do I learn this now? You know? And I thought to myself, if I can learn how to bond composite, I can learn how to prep a crown, I can learn how to do all these fancy, you know, dental technical things. Why can I not personally learn how to be a better leader and a better communicator? So, well, I started reading Dental Town. I read as many books as I could, and I read a ton of books. You know, I don't remember all the books I've read, and some of them I read part way, and then I find the golden nugget of what I like, and then I put it down. But I've read a lot of books, and I think anything can be systematically learned. So, in dentistry, or any career actually, I think if you want to be successful, then you have to be in the office. So, in my program, one of the things that I've broken down to is I, I've taught people to, you know, it goes in stages. The, the program starts out with introvert, uh, intro, you know, examining yourself, I'm sorry, and uh, um, seeing, you know, truly who you are, because I believe that we hold ourselves back. And then from that, I do certain things to build your confidence. And eventually we go to leadership and management your staff and everything's built in a series of steps. Just like in dentistry, if we can break down things in a series of steps that you follow sequentially, then anyone, especially a dentist, can learn this, you know? And we, I, I try to do it in a certain way where we step out of your comfort zone just a little more every time, because I think the biggest thing about dentists is that we are stuck in our comfort zones, you know? Most dentists, at least the ones I meet, tend to be more introverted. And if you're introverted naturally, it's harder, it's scary to step out of your comfort zone a little, okay? So, because, you know, people ask me, why don't you just teach me staff management right away? I'm like, well, if you're afraid to look someone in the eye and tell them to do something right away, I can't jump to that. So if I can build you up in little steps, like teach you how to talk to your patients better because patients are more transient. They come in and out. You know, you don't see them all the time. It's not too personal right away. If we, we can build your confidence in talking to them, then you get more treatment plan acceptances. As a result of it, you're feeling better. You're like, I'm a little more confident. And then from there, we can transition into, hey, let's talk to your staff. We can do it this way and that way. And then eventually, you can look your staff in the eye, tell them what they need to do. And if they... Don't do it, then you're like, we're, we're gonna figure this out. So I believe anything can be learned. Anything you know can be learned, especially if it's presented to you systematically. So what what common what are the low hanging fruit common problems you see in dentists and leadership? Like when you talk to dentists, where are they failing in leadership? What what do they need to focus on? Sure, uh, at least from my personal point of view, like I have I have some dentist friends. I don't have too many dentist friends because, um, but. A lot of dentists I meet, one of the biggest things that I hear commonly is that they let just things boil up. Like, for example, you've heard of dentists where they just blow up their staff, they get mad, they throw something down, or they fire someone on the spot. Well, there's really no reason for that. Even some of my good friends, I hear them, they're like, I got this assistant that's, you know, she's not doing this or that. And then one day he's like, I'm really fed up with this. And I'm like thinking to myself, why haven't you just talked to her this whole time? You know? Um, and I guess part of the thing is that most, you know, most of us are afraid of confrontation. We don't want to confront someone and we may be afraid to hurt their feelings. But what happens is that by doing so, it bottles everything up. And in the end, you might make a rash decision. Like a lot of these things that 
occur, like for someone that bottles things up, it's simply because maybe the staff didn't know what you expected, or maybe it's your fault. You never voiced to your employee what you know they should do in this situation, or 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 if they were doing something you didn't like, you never corrected them. So over time, these little things just build up, and then they accumulate. So uh, I think most dentists, if they just recognize, and in the lecture I break down four reasons why um, management of staff is needed. If they just recognize this, then they can. Uh, they can address these at very early stages where it's actually nothing. I mean, you know, a lot of these little things, if you just told them what you expected right at the beginning, then you don't have to let it fester for a year, you know? And then yeah, I, 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 you know, I tell Dennis, you know, they'll say, you know, I can't believe my assistant does that or I can't believe my reset uh, hygienist does this. And I try to tell them, I say, well, why do you think your hygienist does that mm -hmm. and, a, and a palm tree doesn't do that? Why does your hygienist do it? Don't, don't compare your hygienist to another hygienist. Compare it to a palm tree. I believe a lot of this is hardwired at birth, and we're we're a social animal. So our success was based on that a group of twenty five monkeys and apes and all we all work together. So you're sure. hardwired not to disrupt the group and and to be um, confrontational. You're you're hardwired like we need to get along. And if that hurt my feelings or I don't like that, I just gotta suck it up. And then one day they explode. So I, I'm always telling people that you you have a little five percent frontal cortex. They should be able to understand how the 95% unconscious is hardwired. So, yeah, you just want to hold it all in, but you have to outthink that and say, wow, this, I, I, we can argue facts, but we can't argue feelings. And this is really pissing me off. And I need to smile and say, hey, you know, when you do that, you know, that really bothers me. You know, they just need to let the air out a little all the time instead of just popping one day. Sure. So, so how, how would how would you recommend a dentist develop their leadership skills? Well, there's like personally for what I did is like or for anyone, actually, if you want to develop leadership skills, you can read 50 million books. OK, you can read the experiences of all the successful people in dental town and the unsuccessful people also, because really you can find a trend about why people are successful or unsuccessful. Um, you can go to courses like Dale Carnegie courses that teach you communication and leadership. Or you know, I'm gonna plug it here. You can take my course, guys. It distill all the information for you. Okay. Um, and by the way, everybody that the, everybody that talks about your course to me said just they, just loves it. I mean, and Howard Goldstein is in charge of online CE and the message boards, and we both agree that my God, everyone is your fan. I mean, I, I mean, no, no one's ever watched any of your videos. And said, well, that was a waste of time. I didn't learn anything. They're just like, my God, that guy is awesome. Well, and, and, and it, yeah, it's just amazing. How long has that been up? Uh, I've only had it up for about a month, okay. and uh, the feedback from it's very good. And uh, you know, I, I have personally no idea or expectations of how big this course is supposed to grow or how fast it'll grow, how many people will use it. But it's it's doing pretty dang well. For it, it's forty eight. Yeah. It's forty eight lessons, right? Yes. And how Apparently, long is and how long is each lesson? Uh, so uh, I believe the average lesson is at least fifteen to twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. So. It adds up to quite a bit of information. I and still, I still think you should put the first one or two or three on Dental Town as a teaser, so they get turned on to you. You know, they just they're right there on the site anyway. And well, then, and then, and then after listen to one or two, say if you want the whole kit and caboodle, go to your website dentalmaverick.com. Sure, I'm gonna message Hogo after this. And I think a lot of dentists before they're uh, are probably wondering right now. First, tell us about your office. I mean, are you? Uh, a clinic? Are you a small office? Are you three ops, thirty ops? You know what? What sure. type of dental dentist are you? Okay. Well, you know, one of the things I talk you're, about. You're in Austin, Texas, right? Yes, I'm in Austin, Texas. And so I'm, I'm so thinking. I'm thinking everything's bigger in Texas. So you must have a 300 operatory practice. Oh with, no. With oil wells on each corner okay, okay, and okay. fracking underneath it. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> I have literal. But no. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about is your vision. Whatever you want to do in your life, you should truly know in your heart what your goal is. Because if you don't know what your vision is, everything you decide for your office in terms of anything, marketing, you know, hiring, design, build out your office will affect if you reach that goal. So early in my career, I thought about, I've worked in every type of business. I worked in the Medicaid office. It was very high volume. I saw a patient every 30 minutes. Are these I, all, all in Austin? Yes, all okay. in Austin. So Medicaid? In, yeah, I did Medicaid, I did high volume PPO, and I did fee for service. And then of all the types of businesses I worked on, when I opened my own place, I decided that I wanted low volume, high quality service, high time to the patient to impart the value. And personally, you know, I have back issues. So 
it gets allows me to work at the pace that I want to do and not burn myself out. So my practice is not big. Uh, I actually have, you know, uh, I actually have plumbed for seven operatories, but I don't use seven. I use two of them for storage. I use two for myself. I got three for my hygienist, but I got two hygienists. So the one's like an overflow room kind of. And so it's low volume. Like, and one of the things that I do is when I see patients per day, I really see about four to five doctor mm -hmm. patients a day. I don't like to see more volume because I feel like, I can't impart the value. I can't do the work that I want to do. And so this is the type of office I wanted. This is my vision. And I accomplished it. So, so let me ask you, the, 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 big, um, the big bad grizzly bear out there in dental world um, sure. is, is chain dentistry. Sure. Um, do you do you um, do you think you're 35? Do you think when you're 65? I mean, the, the, the CEOs of these chains are saying that half the people in dental school right now will never own a practice. Um, do you believe, do you believe that when, when you're 35, when you're 45 or 55 or 65, when, let's, let's say 45, 10 years now, do you sure. really believe that half the dental students in dental school today will never own their own practice and can even do anything you're talking about? Or do you think, or what, what do you, what do you think about corporate dentistry? Well, and, and, I, I think, unfortunately, I'm not a fan of corporate dentistry because it's owned by, you know, well, in many cases you have to be officially a dentist to own the chain, but you know, they hide it under rules and, and, and contracts and stuff like that. So I think corporate dentistry is unfortunate because it's run by people that are business people, solely business people, and they're all talking about the, the top, the bottom line dollars for their company. So the downside to dentistry, as many people discuss, is that the cost of dental education is costing so much now. Like when I graduated, it's still a lot. It was like, I don't know what I have, 120,000 in loans, but now, for many schools, especially private schools, they're going up to what, 300, 400? There's a guy that posted like 450. And if you break it down to what you have to pay per month, that's so much. So if I were out of school and I had that debt load, well, there's two ways of thinking about things, okay? Traditional, I believe that the traditional th form of thinking is that, well, you know what? I'm going to get a job. I'm going to get a job and I'm going to work hard, physically hard, see more patients to pay off my note. And that's how the average person thinks. And that's all right. They're going to work in who offers these jobs the most corporate dentistry. So I think eventually, yes, more people will work for corporate dentistry because we are uh, burdened with the high cost of dental education. You know, I'm, I'm kind of an outlier. I think, you know, I don't I don't really think like the average person, I think. So if I had four hundred fifty thousand dollars of loans or whatever, I would say to myself, OK, I could work for a chain. I can work my butt off. Or how can I get ahead real fast? I'm the kind of risky guy. I would learn as much as I could. I'd roll the dice, buy either a very successful practice or take a big loan on top of my loans, build my practice, ramp it up, you know, learn everything about marketing, management, you know, how to drive patients to my office, how to retain these patients. I would do everything to build myself up so I could pay off my loans real fast. Like in my case, I paid off almost a million dollars worth of loans in under five years. I mean, I just... I was like, I'm, I'm going to get rid of this debt because I like toys too. I buy a Cyric machine. I buy a Periolays. I buy all the things because I like, that's the style of dentistry I want. But that's not the average person. So to answer your question, unfortunately, I think as time goes by, we will have more people that work for corporate dentistry because we are burdened by the debt of dental school. And it's getting ridiculous because there's a profit center for dental schools. Okay, so you talked about the uh, burden of debt from dental school. Mm -hmm. What about the burden of debt? Um, you know, I notice on Dental Town, I always look at the uh, what people are searching each month. Obviously, sure. um, um, obviously, if the item costs a hundred dollars, you're not going to spend three hours deciding which one to buy. But if something yeah. costs a hundred thousand dollars, you're going to spend tens of hours thinking about what I say. So there's some big high price stuff out there. So talk to talk to these people out there looking at like a hundred thousand dollars to go from a 2d to a 3d x-ray machine like a cbct or a hundred thousand dollars to go from using a lab up the street to cad cam or fifty thousand dollars to go from uh uh no laser to a laser talk, talk about um would you mind talking about those big oh. cash decisions because well, that, that's that's when they're really sweating out and that that's where dental town when i say no dentist out to practice solo again that's when the reps get done giving them their pitch. They're like, I don't want to be pitched by a rep all by myself. I want to log on to Dental Town and talk to all these amazing minds like yourself. Talk about those three very expensive decisions. Sure. You know, reps, when they come to you, they're, they're just like any business person. It's their job to sell things. Okay. I, I fully respect that. But I'm a type of person that I never make a decision on the spot. You know, you might tell me everything and I might make the decision five minutes later when you've left. 
but I never make a decision on the spot because I like to do research. And I think dental time is great because you have so many people that will give you feedback personally if the product is successful for them or not. But to answer your question about these expensive products and what you buy, once again, I think your vision of what your office will be, what the type of practice that you want to work in, it ultimately determines everything. If I work in a high volume Medicaid office, do I want to buy a Periolase or a Cyric machine? Probably not because some of those procedures are very time consuming. The type of patients, the population of patients that would come into my office probably could not afford some of the procedures I offered. So I wouldn't buy those machines. If my office were fee for service and I have a lower load and I have uh, types of patients that would, you know, be, you know, are into these procedures, you know, they, you know, the, if my type of population of patients uh, value certain services more then I will buy those machines. So uh, when it comes to buying products, I think everyone should research, you know, the product itself first, but then really think about your office. You know, will it fit in with my style of practice, what I want? If my style of practice doesn't fit with this, then it's okay not to buy these things, okay? You know, you, you have to make that personal decision for yourself, but it has to match, I think, your vision about everything and, and what you truly want and what you're truly aiming for has to mesh up. So, I hope, does that make sense? Yes, it does. And, and I've always, uh, and to me, and uh, I went to MBA school at Arizona State University, and I, I just see that as market segmentation. Like, you know, there's a Chevy, a Pontiac, an Olds, a sure. Buick, a Cadillac. And I love my area. I'm in Phoenix, but like, um, one quarter of my five mile pie is the Guadalupe Indian Reservation where most people have dirt floors and I love those people to death and I, I, I see dentistry as, as uh, you know, I, I'm a doctor, I'm there to help you, rich, poor, sure. it doesn't matter. I, I, I love those people. I love doing extraction. And then the next lady might be middle class. The next lady might be expensive. And I, 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 uh, I, I like doing all those procedures. So which of those three did you buy? Did you buy, did you go CBCT? I know you went CIRAC. Um, sure. Did, did you go CBCT? Talk about that decision you made. Okay. For, well, because, I have, because people realize now that you're you're a low volume, high quality, spend more time. Um, that, that is your unique selling proposition. That is your, if it was a car, what would you call it? I'm sorry? If, a car. If, yeah. If, if your analogy to your practice is a car, would you say oh. it's a Chevy, a Pontiac, an Olds, a Buick, a Cadillac, or is it like way out there, Lamborghini? Oh, no. No, or, I'm not a Lamborghini. I'm probably like an Audi. Okay, Audi, so you're an Audi. BMW. I'm like a German luxury car. I'm not an exotic. Uh, I'm not an exotic uh, Italian car where I do super high end full mouth rehab cases. No, actually, my practice is very bread and butter. I do quadrant dentistry. I, you know, I refer out full mouth rehab. I do very routine cases. Okay, that's what I enjoy to do. But no, I do not have a cone beam machine. I have a Cirque machine. Uh, I have two milling units. I have a. I have two, a two milling units. Yeah, well, because one of them is older, so I bought the newer. I bought the MCXL. Okay, talk talk about that decision. Um, why did you spend six figures on a Cerec machine? Or, or well, control. You know, I I take when I do when I do dentistry. I like to do. Uh, I like to be foolproof. I like to take full arch impressions. I like to make sure I see every single thing on my margin. I don't want to think about anything. I like to be as straightforward as possible, so that when I send it to the lab, they have to think about it even less. But the problem is, even though I like to use personally local labs, because if there's just a mailing issue, communication issues, they're just down the road or they're in town, it's easy just to talk to them. But the problem is, I could never personally myself find a lab where I would do things and things would just slip in with minimal adjustment. Even if I took at least myself beautiful impressions that looked flawless, I didn't have the control like I wanted to. So I decided to get like a Cirrus machine because that gives me ultimate control. Like... If something doesn't fit right, it's ultimately my fault. Was my margin not as smooth? Did I not uh, pack the cord clearly enough so I could see my margins and trace it without even thinking about it? Did I image it with an undercut? Did I image it incorrectly? Did I underpowder it, overpowder it? It's all me. You know, if the contact's high, did I leave it on the computer too high or did I not check how the patient was biting down on the side for the buckle bite? It's it's control. Like one of the things I'm doing now is I like for implants, I like to do custom abutments. I like to have everything custom because I want a nice emergence profile. I want all these things. And I switch labs because I had problems with my local lab. And then my new lab that I'm using, I could get these crowns back and I would adjust the occlusion too much. So I said, you know what? I'm going to learn it myself. I've been watching nothing but Cirrhic doctor videos. 
saying I got all my parts in and I'm excited because I got my first case of milling my first abutment coming up. So it gives me the control again. Are, That's you, why are, I bought are you placing the implants? No, I actually, unfortunately, I'm not one of those dentists that place the implants. And I think you say only 10. What is the, what is the percentage of general dentists that, only, that place implants? Well, it's interesting. In the United States, so there's 220 countries. In yeah. the United States, where we have 150,000 dentists and 25,000 of them are specialists, yes. general dentists hardly ever place implants. But yeah. when I go to Brazil and India and China, where they really don't have the nine specialties, they all place implants. Gotcha. And, and it's amazing because you go to China, their their uh, total length of time. <laughs> in America, we say dental school is four years, but did you have a four year undergraduate degree? Yeah, but I finished in three. I'm a nerd. So, so did so did I. So did I, I did mine in three too. But but we all, we all have uh, eight years of college, pretty much. Sure. Uh, you and I have seven, but pretty much eight years. But in China, pretty much everybody total school is maybe only four, five, or six years. And uh, they're, they're all placed in implant. Brazil, it's kind of funny. When you go to the, you know, the four fastest growing economies, the BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. But when you go to Brazil, India, and China, you have two traditional schools. You have the old British Empire type schools where they do four years undergrads and four years of dental school. Then you have the private schools. And my God, like in Brazil and India and Africa, a private school could be nine months. It could be two years. It wow. could be, it could be, Three years would be the longest private school. I've, I, I haven't even seen a private school that's three years. And those kids walk out of there and play some blood. So I think I think the fact that since we have oral surgeons and periodontists, all these specialists, especially ortho, you know, if you, well, I remember when I was in dental school, I asked them how to do ortho. They said, well, if you want to learn how to do ortho, go to orthodontic school. Exactly. And I thought, well, what about half the dentists in America that go to a small town? I mean, for every guy like you in Austin, there's a guy out there in some town of five thousand in uh, in Texas that doesn't have an uh, an orthodontist, and so 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 it's pretty weird. But um, but I, I want to tell you one thing: the uh, in economics they call it the law of unintended consequences, where mm -hmm. um, the politician will pass a tax and they're not aware of what you know other things it does. And um, what I thought was neat about the CIRAC is um, I obviously had um, gone from eye vision to loops and mm -hmm. I magnify everything three and a half X. But I think the best thing that Sirac did for me is when you're scanning that prep oh, yeah. and you see your prep 40 times larger, you're like looking around saying, I hope no one sees sure. this. And it's so for me, I didn't realize how much of a uh, horrible prep you could do and send it to the lab and they could just put dice spacer and just cover up all your craziness. And now when I'm looking at this stuff at 40 X, I spend more time on my, my preps, tripled in quality and in, in fact Detola was Mike Detola was telling me something the other day that now he just knows that when he's like uh smoothing a burf he sees like a when he when the uh, a finishing burr when he sees a white line he doesn't even have to scan it to know that a 40x is going to be a huge divot so sure. whenever he's smoothing out he sees like a white flash he's like divot you know smooth extra but I I think it's uh I think a lot of doctors are having a hard time seeding uh uh crowns they just always blame it on their lab. They're like, oh my God, I, you know, this crown, I had to adjust it and it was so hard to get. Yeah, dude, maybe you have a horrible prop. Uh, yeah. may, maybe it was rough. And, and and then you see some of these guys on Dental Town that <laughs> the prep looks like it was almost polished acrylic. Those are the crowns that drop in. So yeah, so so seeing anything 40 times larger just makes you better. I agree with you. I see some of my early, my initial sear crowns, and you know, I always take a post-op X-ray to make sure the margins are closed and stuff like that. And they're closed, but I can now. I wear higher magnification now, but I can look at my initial ones, and I'm like, man, that that that, that margin could have been a lot smoother. And my margins now are way smoother because you're right. As you blow them up, you're just looking at it. You're like, what? That doesn't look good. Then now you just know. You just what, what type? Of, well, no, because you don't see it. What type of magnification are you wearing on your eyes? I think I wear three and a half. Three and a half, and yeah. do, you, do you wear a light on your forehead? Oh, of course, that's the best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What what light are you using? What what light and loops are you using? You know what? I used to use oroscopic, uh, but now I use everything Lumidet. I use their Lumidet through the lens. Uh, I think it's three and a half. I think it is, or three point two, or something like that. And I use their light, and all my assistants, all my staff, they have their own lights and stuff because when they do work, they can just see more. It's yeah, like, that was a big deal for my quality too. Is that you go into a dental office and the dentist has loops on. Mm -hmm. But his assistant doesn't, his hygienist doesn't. It's like, you you know you need them. Yeah. Why would you not have your clinical assistant and your hygienist? I, I had a dentist who complained the other day about his hygienist, you know, left some tartar or whatever, and you could see it on the bite wing or whatever. I'm like, well, why? I mean, she's the same age you. 
You're mm-hmm. both 40 and you, you're you wearing three and a half and she's wearing naked eye vision. I mean. And you know what? It's crazy. If you ever take off your loops or you turn off your light and you try to look in someone's mouth, you're like, I can't see anything. Oh, I'm so you- spoiled now that I had a, uh, I had a, a loop issue. One of them fogged. Yeah. So I told myself, um, I, I, I'm done for the day. And they're yeah. like, are you kidding me? You didn't wear loops the first five years you practiced. I said, well, I can't do it without. So now, now they have two loops and two oh, lights yeah. because they, they had no idea that Howard would oh, yeah. cancel patients if his yeah, loops went out. I got backups out. of everything now. <laughs> Same mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, redundancy. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so what um, – so – um, what is the low hanging fruit? Would you say of uh, you know you have forty eight videotapes? How, how many hours would it take just for a dentist listening to watch those from start to finish? Um, I I am not exactly sure, but I think it's in the thirteen to fourteen hour range. And, and yeah. you're you're right about weekend courses. I want to say one thing about weekend courses. When I look back at like the uh, five weeks I spent at the Pink Institute, now 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 you know a decade later or two decades later, whatever. I think the neatest thing about going to those courses was, was meeting people like you at those courses. I mean, I look back and like, like, like I went through the whole Carl Mission to seven, three day weekends. And I mean, some of those guys are still my best friends in implants. So I like the social aspect. That's what I love about dental town. I love meeting people like you. You know what I mean? I love the social aspect, but as far as learning information, it's amazing how all the research is coming out saying the whole education system in America is wrong. A kid can't learn from eight to three thirty. That's not how a brain works. And pretty much after an hour, the brain's done and needs to walk around and eat something and scratch or, you know, do something. And I, I love how your videos – talk about the links of your videos. They're uh... – Sure. Like, like I said, there, there's a reason that I picked the videos between like um, not too long, like 15 to 20 minutes. Some of them are actually a little longer, but I don't like to keep them too long because there's a statistic somewhere that I did research on on Google somewhere. It says like people's a video attention for watching videos online – like is about 15 minutes or so like after that they start losing attention so i like to get my you know when you go to courses there's a lot of filler you know there's a lot of you know hey anyone have questions you know let's take a break and do stuff like that so when you're in my videos because i'm writing it and you know i'm i'm to the point i'm pretty concise i try to pack all the information in such a manner that you can understand it in about 15 to 20 minutes and I end each video with highlights that you should implement and think about for the next week or so. Because like I said, I think to learn stuff, it takes your mind time to marinate on the things that you learn. Some of the things might be simple principles, but they're profound. And if you don't give your time, your, yourself time to analyze it, uh, you know, put in your psyche, you're, you're, you're not going to implement it. You're not going to understand it fully. Like, like for example, I, I'm a fly fisherman. And there's something in fly fishing, fly fishing called a double haul, which is a type of casting. And I read this double haul so many times, and I practiced it, and I could not get it done. And then finally, I just said, whatever. I read it, I went to sleep, and in my dream, I remember distinctly in my dream, my brain figured out how to do it. And in the morning, I woke up and I could do it. It's because your, your brain needs time to, to analyze these things and just, you know, you know Figure it out for yourself. So you so, talk about you talk about fly fishing in creeks in Texas for trout or what? What, what are you fly fishing for? Well, in, in Texas around. you can fly fish for bass, you know, in the freshwater. In, but I really like saltwater fly fishing. Ocean? Yeah, like in the bay. That's the best type of fly fishing. You mean the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, like you can go in the bay. Like I like doing shallow water fishing, like knee deep or ankle deep, and you look for these fish called redfish. Redfish. You'll see yeah. Tail. yeah, you'll see like like I'll stalk them all day, like. You know, I'll wait or I'm on a boat with my buddy and we'll stalk them. Like, and you look for the fish or you look for the activity on the water or you look for their tails out and then you sneak up to them and you cast your fly and you catch them. I love it because it's a challenge. You know, Jerome Smith on Dental Town out of Lafayette, Louisiana. Oh, what's his name? Jerome Smith. No, he, I don't know him. Yeah, he, he taught me how to do that in the, uh, the bayou of Louisiana. Oh, so, what, yeah. kind of, what kind of beer do you drink when you do that? Actually, I do not drink beer when I fish. <laughs> you're you're a I'm, purist. You're I'm a purist. Only when you only when you watch football, huh? <laughs> only when I watch football. When I'm fishing, my brain shuts off. Like my thirst, my hunger, everything. It's just like it's like my fish radar goes on. I want I want I want to move your amazing mind to the uh, the most stressful part for dentists. I mean, they've told me this for 27 years. You know, they would much rather do a root canal filling or a crown then try to manage staff. And I don't want to throw anybody a bridge, but I, you know, I'm not, you know, um, if you worked uh, in dentistry, 98% of your employees are women. And, um, you know, we have half the graduating class is women, half are men. But um, 
Let's talk about the stressful worst part. When I ask dentists, what's the worst part about being a dentist? They say managing five women. That is so hard. And I don't want to sound sexist or anything. That's just what they tell me. So, sure. so l- let's switch gears to that. What would you tell a dentist says, I, 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 g- g- tell me if you don't see this. After every time a dentist done a canal, he gets up, goes to his office and shuts the door. Yes. Yet during a football game, you don't, the head coach is standing there on the sideline the whole game. I mean, I've never in the NBA say, well, where's the coach? Oh, he just went back to his office and underneath the stadium and closed the door. So the dentist, when they're done, they don't walk the office and go talk to the front office and peek their head in the room and talk to the high. They they don't have a sense of what's going on. They go back into their cave, their man cave, and shut the door. And and when I talk to staff, like, well, what is your practice or how often do you have staff meetings? They go, are you kidding me? My doctor's either doing a root canal or he's in his office with the door shut. And uh, so so that's the most stressful thing these dentists tell me. Give them some advice, some low-hanging fruit on how to interact and manage and lead two receptionists, two assistants, and a hygienist. Okay. Well, the first thing is that a lot of offices, if you can read on Dental Town, a lot of people don't like staff meetings. Okay. I have a staff meeting every day. It's not long. It's not complicated. It's like eight minutes. Okay. But if you have routine staff meetings... What does it allow you? One, now, is, it, is, this, is this the team huddle in the morning? Is this eight minutes yeah. where you start? Okay, so you're talking yeah. about a morning huddle. Morning huddle. Okay. okay. Like, some dentists don't like to do this. I, I really don't know why, but personally, I love it because it gives you – it starts your day, okay? But it gives you a couple of opportunities, okay? When something goes wrong, okay, or there's an issue that bothers you, okay? Remember, your staff might not realize this because perhaps you didn't voice it to them or you never addressed it or they approached a situation that you've never even covered – but something, if it's in your head and bothers you, if you have a morning meeting every day, what does that mean? It means that whatever offending issue to you is very fresh in their mind, okay? One of the things that people teach in management or you can read about is that if you have an issue with someone, you should not let it fester. Because if you tell them five months from now, hey, remember that one time you did something? They're going to be like, no, what are you talking about? If you have an offending issue and you address it in the moment or very soon after it, the person's going to remember it. You know, hey, Sally, yesterday we had this thing and uh, blah, 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 blah. They're going to remember it. So one of the things I like to do is I have a morning meeting every day. You know, we go over what patient we're seeing, you know, we go over things like what's the upcoming treatment, what do we need to talk about, who do we ask for referrals, because referrals are very important to build your online presence. But uh, if I have an issue with something, you know, and oftentimes it's very minor, like, hey, you know, Sally, I didn't like it that after, you know, after you, you you mentioned to me to, to do the hygiene check, you had to wait on me a little bit and you didn't show the patient pictures of the teeth of the upcoming treatment. You know, that's perfect time to go over these things. So little things like that. And of course, she'll remember it. She's like, yeah, you're right. But having a morning meeting is an opportunity for you to go over these little things. I gotta, Everything's an opportunity. I, I, I got I to gotta stop right here and throw you under a bridge. Um, dude, you're 35 and progressive. All hygienists tell me their doctor doesn't allow them to talk about dentistry, show them an x-ray because they're diagnosing. And when, and if they start sure. saying, Oh, you, you know, you're going to need a crown there. They get in trouble. Sure. So That's talk, it. so talk to okay. that doc right now. Okay. Who's handcuffed as hygienist. She's sure. not allowed to say this tooth's going to need a crown. This will probably need a root canal. Sure. She's not because, because she's diagnosing and that's sure. illegal in the state of Texas. And you know, it, doc, sure. uh, you know, absolutely. A hygienist and assistant cannot diagnose. They do not have the rule, the, the right to diagnose, okay? But you have the ability to talk about, say, hey, you you can plant the seed. One thing I learned, uh, I, I, one time when I was designing my office, I hired, uh, you know, design ergonomics because I thought I want, you know, I wanted to maximize my space. And I was very curious. I was like, how does David Ahern, the owner of, of design ergonomics, do work, you know? So I kept bugging them. And finally, they, 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 they transferred me the call or he called me back or something like that. And I had some time to talk to him. I was like, hey, what do you do? And I was like, you know, what do you do to know what's going on? And he, tell, he told me some secrets. He was like, you know, I have my hygienist cover things that she suspect is going on. And so he just told me very briefly about it. So I thought about it and I expanded on that. And this is how I do it in my office, okay? Like your hygienist, your staff cannot legally diagnose something. But certainly, if they're in the mouth and they're working on teeth and they see a tooth with a big crack or obviously a big cavity, you know, 
they can show. I call it in my I call it in my video series co diagnosing. I made up that term. I don't know if it was a real term or not, but certainly they can show the picture of it and be like, "Oh, Mrs. Smith, I don't know if you saw this tooth right here. You can see that there's a big hole here. There's a fracture. You know, there's probably something going on right here. You know, you know, it looks like possibly a big cavity. You know, I'm not. Sh- you know, I, I, you know, Dr. Pham is going to come in. He's going to confirm all these and he's going to discuss it with you. So they can do what's called planting the seed. Anything that they see, they can show. That's why I have intraoral cameras. You know, they can show all these things and they can plant the seed to the patient of possibly what's going on. But I make sure they tell them, you know, all these things that they're saying, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, they're, they're just giving you an idea. They're just showing you the facts of what they see. But Dr. Pham, myself, is going to come in and confirm if these are true or not. So, you know, to those people that say, oh, I don't want my hygienist doing anything, you're missing out because one of the things that you can read about is that to be, for a patient to understand or accept something, they have to hear it multiple times, okay? There's like a magic number, I'd say at least three times or more. So if you can have your hygienist, your assistant talking about it when they hand off your front desk, and also talk about calibrating your staff, meaning that everyone in your office should understand, and I do this with all my staff at least once a year, I show them x-rays of things, I show them pictures of things, and we call it a calibration meeting where they understand what I'm looking for, why we do all these procedures, how it affects the patient, how it benefits the patient. I answer all their questions if they don't understand it. You know, if I have a new employee, I, I, I might have a lunch with her where I go over all these things so that she understands it so everyone's on the same page. So when my hygienist or my assistant, no, they cannot legally diagnose anything. They don't put it, you know, they, they, they do not tell the patient, you have a cavity here and we need to do this. They may say, look, you see a hole here. We see cracks here. This, you see this big black thing? That's that's kind of soft. You know, there's a broken part of your tooth. Dr. Pham's gonna come in here and he's gonna tell you what's going on, but they can plant the seeds. They can show the patients everything that they suspect is going on, but of course, never legally diagnosed. Um so, I so, saw so doc, on those those memory studies, whenever I read memory studies, they say that you're right, you gotta hear it multiple times. Also, it helps to see it in here, multiple yes. senses. So, uh, so on intro camera, I hope this guy alone. What intro camera did you buy? Did you do you print out a Polaroid picture, or is this digitally on the screen? Sure. Did you also did you, do you still use film X ray, or did you go digital? And and do you think um, explaining dentistry is better? Uh, with an oral picture on a computer screen or a digital x-ray picture, or does it really not matter? Sure. So in my office, I have big TV screens. I think they're close to 30 inches, I believe. I'm not sure. That comes from the ceiling down. So uh, we show all our x-rays or all our pictures up there. Now, I believe in everything in life, there's a cost to benefit ratio. Like I can buy $5,000 cameras that show every single detail in the world. But honestly, do I really need that? Now, believe it or not, I get my cameras I don't buy very expensive cameras. I use cameras on eBay. I put plastic sleeves over them for, you know, obviously infection control, but they're just simple cameras. You know, I actually have a- You mean mean an extra oral camera or you mean an intraoral camera? Intraoral camera. And what what what, what brand? I mean, you mean just just anything used? I just, no, I I went on eBay and I looked up intraoral camera and I bought one that's like 150 bucks or something like that just to test it out. Oh my God, Did, did you start a thread on this on Dentaltown? No, there are other threads, but there are many people that on Dentaltown have used this. They're very similar cameras. I think they're called like MD740 or something like that. They oh, show please, the please, please email me, email me that. I, I got to see that. Okay. That, that. That's amazing because there's All no right. re, there's no reason an intro camera should be ten grand, right? No. I, well, there are some that have very high quality optics, but the question is, do you? It's like everything costs a benefit. If you're just showing a patient and it's clearly a broken tooth or clearly big crack lines, how much resolution do we clearly need? If I can, if my camera shows it, I'd rather have 50 of these backup cameras in case they break. I'll just hook another one up rather than having one super expensive camera that I have to shuttle between all the rooms or, or you know, uh, or, or share. You know, I'd rather so, have more. So, so, you went, so you went on eBay and typed in what? Dental intro oral cameras. And then I saw some and then I searched Dental Town old threads just to see people's responses of what worked or not. I just took a gamble. I don't care. I really care. It's like 150 bucks or something like that. If it breaks, then eh, whatever. It's not the end of the world. I spent 150 bucks on it. And, 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 you, know, and, you, and you know what one of the biggest unused hidden secret assets of Dentaltown is? The free classified ads. I mean, yes. dentists, dentists will go out and buy the most expensive stuff. and like, dude, there's 10 of them for sale on the free classified ads for half off, a third, sure. you know, a quarter. Okay, so you, you went to eBay and typed in intro camera. Yeah. Um, are you using film or are you using digital? 
I'm I'm everything digital. Okay. Do you do you print, do you have a need to print out the X-ray or just showing it is enough uh, with the camera and the X-ray? Is that enough? Or are you printing them out or? I don't print them out. Um, I, I I like I said I train my 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 hygienist and my assistants to show things that they know that I would show the patient. So before I step in, usually they've already shown the X-ray if it's significant. If you can see the calculus or you see big cavities or you know obviously any a non-dental person can see they i make sure they show them if it's a tooth with a broken cusp a big cavity a busted out you know you've seen those teeth with huge gray ha halos on the facial cusp because there's like a big decay then we show it you know and you asked a question earlier what works best well pictures work best because sometimes there's well not work best but sometimes pictures work a thousand words you know it gives them very clearly and a view of their tooth that they've probably never seen in their whole life but one of the things that I also talk about in my lecture is that you should always, uh, uh, you know, anticipate what the patient's going to think. You know, you can term it addressing the objection before it is one. But a lot of times people will look at a picture and they're like, I, I love it when people have teeth that are broken or, you know, obviously a big cavity. I'm like, you see that? And they're like, dang, doc, that doesn't look good. I'm like, does it hurt? And they're like, no. So if you can address their objection of why their tooth doesn't hurt, even though there's a big hole, that's glorious. And that's where... A lot of I think a lot of dentists need help on is that the communication aspect of it is very important. You know, people might look at something, but if you don't address why what they're thinking ahead of time, why doesn't my tooth hurt if it looks like this? And if you create a story using analogies or stories, whatever, you could paint them through this path where you show them this picture and you say, hey, this is why your tooth doesn't hurt because your enamel is the hardest thing in your body. In the middle of the tooth, there's a nerve. You got to eat through all this stuff before you get towards the nerve. And the average person has no discomfort until the cavity is on top of the nerve. Boom! It makes sense to them. And all of a sudden, they're like, now I see my dentist. Ah, this, this finally makes sense to me. I see the value. I'm going to go do this now. So I, I want to I want to say one comment on that. I also think that um you know and when I grew up, our family, my mom and dad were very uh, very Catholic. My two older sisters went straight to the Catholic nunnery right out of high school. Um, I noticed that in 17 years of going to mass, a hundred percent of every morning, no one ever raised their hand and asked the priest a question. Um, I think that um when hygienists and assistants um, show them stuff, the patients more relaxed to ask them a question. Sure. Where they might not want to ask a priest sure. or a rabbi or a doctor sure. and all that sure. stuff. And also they might think the doctor lives in a big house with a fancy car Absolutely. and is trying to sell me a root canal. But Absolutely. when the sweet little dental assistant or high dentist says you need a root canal, uh, very different. But I want to, I want to, um, I only get you for uh, eight more minutes and I hope okay. you, I hope you come back another day and do another one with me. But so if you're a, uh, cause I know what these dentists are thinking, they're saying, well, Doc, if you're a low volume, high quality patient, mm -hmm. where are you getting these patients? Sure. I mean, I mean, is, is it because since you're slowing down and taking the time, it's all word of mouth referral? Or are you also augmenting that with any marketing? Is any marketing sure. helping you find these types of patients? Can you spend, you know, I only got you for seven minutes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Well, I think there's three tiers of patients, okay? And I'm just going to call them tiers for the sake of it. There is the type of patient that is mostly concerned about the cost, and that's typically the DMO Medicaid crowd. There's the type of patients that are the fee-for-service crowd, which are more concerned with quality or perception of quality and making themselves feel important and giving the having time with the doctor, you know. And then there's the mid crowd, which is like the PPO one that is concerned with that, but more swayed by crisis, okay. So once again, I go back to vision because you need to understand which market that you're aiming towards, okay. If you market wrong towards the type of market that you intend to be, then you shoot yourself in the foot. So I understand my market. I'm a fee-for-service office, so I do a lot of marketing. I send uh, next year... I, I took it a little easy this year because I want to just work a little less. But next year, I'm going to ramp back up. But uh, next year, I'm going to send at least 100,000 mailers uh, to direct my... Mail. Direct mail. Direct mail. Direct mail. You're still thousand. into the old school, old-fashioned print direct mail it in the works. mailbox. It really? Works. I swear it works. I can track... I and is, track this, is this a one-mile radius of your office? A two-mile, three-mile? Uh, or I do... I do three zip codes, which I think the lead goes up to like four miles ish around my neighborhood. Because I over four, the years, four mile diameter. Yes. Okay. Yes. Four mile diameter. Yes. Because okay. I've tracked over the years certain areas not to to, to advertise to. Because I realized I was advertising to those patients when they came to my office. Like I said, their priorities were different, so I would never see them again. So. I've tailored my advertising, but I do a lot of direct ma mailing. Uh, we do get a lot of word of mouth. Okay, uh, location certainly important. I'm one of the when I first came to this area, 
there were three dentists before that didn't take this because the cost of build out was very high. But I'm like, this, this location is golden. The average dentist thinks that, hey, this is just all cost. But I'm like, the cost of my location clearly will clearly outweigh the cost that I would spend the difference in advertising and so be more expl effective. Explain that. Does that, so that mean you're in a high visible commercial Absolutely. Re retail center? What, describe yes. the retail center. Well, uh, it's I mean, is that nice... a grocery store? Is it a okay. or what, well, what? What is the retail okay. center? I live in a very nice part of town. Uh, uh, it's a very nice part of town, and so uh, it is uh, a retail center with a grocery store. Uh, I'm almost next to Starbucks, um, so it's a very high visibility. And if you travel the area, it's also nice too because the way that the neighborhood works is that. This is where they all have to go pretty much to exit the neighborhood. So one thing you should think about too is traffic flow also. I analyzed all these things. I drove all through town when I was looking for my location. I, I tried to learn as much as I could about traffic flow and all these things and I evaluate the neighborhoods and everything. Now, now and what made you pick Austin? Were you, were you born and raised there? Where, where did you go to dental school and how did you end up in Austin? Well, well I, I, know, I know you were born in Germany, sure. but, but, where, but how, did, how did you fall in Austin? Sure. Was, I that, in, was, was that a demographic decision or just that's no, where you were? No. I grew up in Houston and I'm a Longhorn, so I went to UT, UT University, <laughs> Texas in Austin. And then I thought about where I wanted to live. Like I had the opportunity to move to Dallas and it would pay me when I was an associate like three times more than what it made. But I told myself, long-term commitment. I want to live in Austin because I enjoy the city. I enjoy the lifestyle. It's not a concrete city like Houston that's so big. I get to do outdoor things. And so I picked Austin. So long-term plan, I picked Austin. And when I was ready to open, I drove all around town. I, I didn't, you know, I had a demographic report eventually, but the best thing in part personally, in my opinion, is going on Google Maps, typing in dentists for areas that you want to see. You plot them, I print them out. I drove everywhere in the city to confirm these areas. And then wow, I, that's genius. I never thought, I just got flat out like, wow. So go over the details of that exactly how you got to the older dentists like me. Go to, you said Google Map? I go to Google Maps and I type, I zoom into the parts of areas that I put that I thought I wanted to be in. Tell them, how to, how, tell them how you zoom in. What does that mean? Oh, I get on my mouse and I get the little scrolly thing and I scroll it forward so it zooms in closer. Oh, to, okay, desktop, yeah. not mobile. Yeah. Okay, yeah. desktop. Yeah, it's easier to do on your desktop because you're looking okay. at a big screen. Okay. And then I type in Dennis and I see where it boop, 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 plots it. And then I look at it and I'm like, oh, there's high saturation here or there's, a, there's, a, there's an area open spot right here. And then I print these maps out and I put little red dots and then I drop, got my car and I drove around the city. And once I found the areas that looked good, I looked for commercial buildings that were available. And then I jotted the information and I drove the neighborhood. Can you, can you do me a huge favor? I, I'm in about a dozen dental schools a year, every year. I, I lecture in there for free. Um, you need to start a thread, how to use Google Maps for demographics and, okay. and, and some screenshots. And then I can email that to every dental student because we know who the dental students are because their email address is, um, and there's only like 54 different email addresses and every one of those dental schools, about 80, 90% of them are members. I'd love to, I'd love for you to start that thread and me email to everybody with a okay. double student because that's yeah, very just, simple. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, that's I'll, genius. That yeah. is genius. Because I think there's value in a demographic report. But remember, demographic reports are they're, they're, they give you so much information. I get this this paper and there's so much information, but I don't care what people say. To me, there's nothing like driving the area because you see the neighborhood, you see the people that live there. Like for example, if I go through a neighborhood and I see in the immediate area and I see a bunch of lawns that are unkept, you know, there's not, they don't follow the HOA, then that tells me, okay, the type of practice that if I wanted to build like a high-end practice, would it work in this area? No, probably because the people that are, in, they don't keep their lawns up kept. So what is important to them? You know, it, it gives you a lot of information. Everything in life is psychology, you know, so, dentistry is psychology. So, so, so you're talking about, um, um, Talk about new patients. Um, that that really surprised me that a young high tech kid like yourself is into old school direct mail that's been around for a century. That was me. Um, you obviously went for the location. Obviously, by going lower volume, you're going to get more word of mouth referral because you're spending time with these people. Sure. But besides location, direct mail, and word of mouth referral from low volume spending time, is there anything any other? Oh, any absolutely. Other? One of the biggest growths that I have right now is Google. And so one of the things that I do now is there's that guy, Bob Summers, he types on the, you know, dental town every once in a while. He owns that best local review website or something like that, that someone posted once. And it's glorious and it's genius because they tell you to 
ask someone for a review at the height of their experience, meaning you're not going to ask someone that had a terrible experience to write a review. You're going to ask someone they're like, ah, this is the most glorious thing ever. And then, so the glory, the, the, the beauty of this program is that it gives you more control because if you ask for a review of someone that is likes you, when they go in, you send them an email through this program, it asks you what they want to rate you. If it says five stars, then they send you to the review sites. If it's less than five stars, it sends you to your site that posts you their review so you can read it, but it doesn't go on the public internet. And what's the name of that? Best Local Review, I believe. BestLocalReview.com. I, be I believe that's what it's called. Uh, I don't want to recall the top of my head, but in any case, so what happens is, like compared to my the dentist around me, I have at least five to six times the number of Google reviews. My ranking is much higher, and I know Google ranks uh, your your views and the the uh, consistency of it and um, the numbers of reviews to determine your placement on Google. So not only do I have a lot of reviews, I have current reviews that keep going up. That keep getting posted versus and, other and ones. That, and that's bestlocalreviews.com. I believe so. I can is, check on my computer. Is there, is there a thread on that on Dental Town? There is a thread somewhere. And that's okay. how I found out about it. Someone mm. was like, I use this program and now I have more reviews. And I read about it. It's like 50 bucks a month or something like that. But it's okay. totally worth it. Well, buddy, we are out of time. That was the fastest right. hour of podcast I've ever done. Uh, no, I had fun. I did. And uh, thank you for your 8,000 amazing posts on Dental Town. Thank you for uh, dentalmaverick.com. Um, is there any how, – how, what if someone just wants to send you an email? Can they, can they do that or sure. – what, what? Oh, Sorry. They can send me – they can go to my website, dentalmaverick.com, or they can just send me an email to T-U-A-N – at dentalmaverick.com and it goes to my phone and I'll read it. And, read and, all my emails. and spell out Dental Maverick just in case they... Uh... Sure. It's uh, D-E-N-T-A-L-M-A-V-E-R-I-C-K.com. And I could send an email Tuan, T-U-A-N at dentalmaverick.com. Yes. Yes. And uh, so, um, gosh, thanks for an hour. I, uh, well, I thanks hope, for inviting I, me. That was I, fun. I, I hope you put up a, a teaser of your 48 uh, video program. I hope you put a teaser up on Dental Town so the uh, people uh, I have. stumble on that. Yeah. And uh, thank you for all that you do, buddy. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. This was fun. Okay. Thanks a lot. Have a great all day. Right. Have a good one. Bye.